So thanks, Mike, uh, for a somewhat exaggerated introduction, but uh, I'll take it. Uh, so yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is my first time in, at UC Riverside, actually first time in Riverside, <clears throat> although I have a lot of uh, good and some long time friends uh, here. So it's, uh, it's nice to visit. Uh, they put me at the Mission Inn, and it's just a pretty breathtaking place. So I really appreciate Mike being such a gracious and generous host. So yeah, so I, uh, I come from Boulder, Colorado. This is uh, uh, our campus. Uh, like any, it's situated at the foot of uh, uh, Rocky Mountains. These are the three flat irons. That's kind of the iconic uh, image of Boulder. Uh, like any respectable uh, state university, we have a football stadium. That's the kind of the focus of the of the uh, of campus. But like if you squint and look carefully, this building is the Gamow Tower where the physics department is and all the offices are. And right next to it, <coughs> that's where all the areas of physics are, except for AMO, which are in the tower next to it. Uh, uh, Boulder is known for its AMO physics as well as soft matter physics. So this is the Gila Tower, the famous Gila Tower, and below it is the, with all the experiments you undoubtedly heard about BCs and all kinds of degenerate atomic gases experiments going on, and uh, ultra precision micro microscopy and things like that. Anyway, so yeah, so I kind of split my time. I'm a condensed matter theorist. I split my time between soft and hard matter, but and so sometimes I put on a hat, and H bar is one, and KBT is zero, uh, but today, uh, KBT will be one, H bar will be zero. There won't be any topology or anything uh, too exotic, but I hope to, you know, my goal is to still impress upon you how rich classical physics can be, as long as uh, you're in the condensed matter domain. And so that takes me to uh, <coughs> what I want to talk about. So this is a colloquium, so uh, I, I wanted to string together a couple of uh, ideas. So there'll be three ideas, and they're three topics, and so I call them like three vignettes because, you know, they're really kind of independent, and so I can really talk, I could have given a colloquium on each one of these, uh, but I decided to try to actually weave a theme and connect them together. And so I'm going to talk about, one is mostly experimental part of the talk, the first part, will be about a new state of matter, liquid crystal phase of matter, which is depicted here or here, where we call it twist bend pneumatic or heliconical twist bend pneumatic, uh, as the picture suggests, uh, or sometimes we call it TBN for short. <clears throat> it's about a new state of matter that's been discovered of liquid crystals that spontaneously breaks chiral symmetry. So just kind of to jump ahead, if you think about it, it's uh, you know nature and life is chiral, that's, but that's because uh, you know our biology is chiral because molecules on which it's built. Uh, chiral molecules, life is chiral, but here this liquid is made up of molecules that are not chiral, so they look the same in, as a, unlike your hands, left and right hand, look the same in a, as, a, as a mirror image, but nevertheless they spontaneously, as you cool, cool this liquid, it spontaneously decides to start twisting into a chiral object, okay, or the liquid becomes chiral, so it becomes optically chiral, uh, optically active to light, uh, left and right circularly polarized light responds differently, is birefringent with respect to right and left circularly polarized light, and various other effects. So, it, and that's been somewhat of a holy grail. And I'm going to tell you the route to discovery of this material and discovery, deciphering that this is what's going on. So that's one sort of a vignette. The other one uh, is going to be, I'm going to talk about what's called an emergent Higgs mechanism of, uh, it's kind of a general phenomenon that I like to talk about and occurs in many contexts. But in particular, I can tie it to this particular phase. There's some kind of an emergent Higgs mechanism that's going to happen in this phase. Sounds really highfalutin and scary, but you will see it's not. It's going to be very simple, uh, the way I understand it, the way I explain it. Okay. <clears throat> and finally, I'm going to talk about critical phases. And what I mean by that is we all are we all know about critical points, which describe uh, points of phase transition between two phases of matter. And that's when fluctuations, as the system can decide which phase it's in, fluctuations become very important. And that's been the kind of a uh, huge activity for the last 50, 60 years, understanding critical points. But what I'm going to describe is something much more 
exotic and much more interesting in a sense, where rather than having just a critical point, you have a whole phase of matter which is critical. And I'm going to argue that this is an example of a critical phase. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if you have clarifying questions, don't, in, don't in hesitate to interrupt. So this is a colloquium, so I'm going to start way, way back. I don't know if uh, there are a lot of students in the audience. Uh, but so let me, let me start with a kind of an introductory slide. So first, let me talk about general generality of condensed matter physics. So when we first learn about matter, you know, we kind of, uh, like in high school, this is the kind of a image that we see, a phase diagram. There are three phases of matter, liquid, gas, and solid. And, you know, there's a lot of lies hidden in this slide because in reality, and I could dissect it, but I'm not going to. It's somewhat obvious with the second slide. You know, in reality, if you're a condensed matter physicist, you know, world and condensed matter really looks more like this. It's really uh, <clears throat> breathtaking richness of systems you know, ranging from, you know, semiconductors, superconductors, magnetism, quantum Hall effect, liquid crystals, uh, granular materials, rubber, you name it, topological defects, uh, semiconductors. And this is just a small cross-section uh, of kind of representative uh, examples of condensed matter physics. And uh, one may ask, if you don't study condensed matter physics, what is it? What is the unifying theme here? Why are all these belonging to the same field of study? And uh, uh, the, the point is that, you know, that, so, so from my perspective, and that's, I, I think it's an accurate perspective uh, shared by most uh, practitioners of the field, is what makes condensed matter rich and exciting, and it's shared by all these examples, is uh, two ingredients. One is you want to have a macroscopic number of constituents. You know, if you have one atom or you have one electron, like in particle physics, or one, one elementary particle, or you're doing atomic physics on a single isolated or very dilute set of particles, then from the condensed matter point of view, that's not condensed matter physics. From condensed matter point of view, it's boring, even though as a, you know, it has its own interesting, obviously interesting, uh, uh, phenomena that one might study. So one ingredient is having macroscopic number, number constituents. So macroscopic objects, or mic macroscopic can be in the order of even microns, as any of these systems are. And it doesn't matter what those constituent, constituents are. Could be electrons in the, in the superconductor, could be s grains of sand in a sand pile, or it could be birds flying, you know, collectively flying, a flock of birds, a, a school of fish or something like this. So that's one ingredient. The other ingredient that makes it non-trivial, and you need both, is interactions, strong interactions. If you have a gas in this room, it has a, you know, many fold Avogadro number of uh, molecules in this room, but they're basically boring ga ideal gas, and that's because the interactions are so weak because it's so dilute. So you need both. If you have strong interaction, you have macroscopic network constituents, you get richness. That richness is emergent, and that's what we all are focused on, studying condensed matter physics, and that's why it's so non-trivial. You, just to give you an example, if you have like a <clears throat> you know, two-dimensional liquid of electrons, then the best computer, you know, if you really, you really need to treat them quantum mechanically, best computer, modern computer with all the parallelism can maybe uh, solve many body Schrodinger equation for, the, for maybe like 10 electrons, 12 electrons, 15 electrons in, in the, in the, in the two-dimensional sample. So, it's, you really, it's really an incredibly challenging problem to treat strongly interacting macroscopic number of degrees of freedom. And that's what makes uh, condensed matter physics so rich and, uh, and, uh, uh, and exciting. Uh, and it, it displays phenomena that we can't anticipate just from single particle description. So probably the, one of the quintessential classical Examples of condensed matter physics are liquid crystals, like in display of your iPhones and laptops. So these are systems, or these are systems of anisotropic molecules, like here, for example, 5CB. It's usually organic molecules, but it doesn't have to be. It can be just some some rod-like molecule, which just has a very large geometrical aspect ratio. It could be either big disks, thin disks with a large di diameter compared to the thickness or rod-like molecules that are displayed here. Once you have this, you'll have many more phases of matter, qualitative distinct phases of matter, than just ordinary fluid, isotropic fluid, and a crystal on the other end. 
right? So there's intermediate phases of matter, and what unifies these phases of matter, what, what, what defines the liquid crystal in terms of phases of matter, is they, they break, spontaneously break spatial symmetry. So for example, this guy is an isotropic fluid. So it's a fluid, it, it pours, but it's isotropic because not only are the molecules located in random positions and they're diffusing around like an ordinary fluid, but a rods, these rod-like molecules are completely randomly oriented. So that's why it's isotropic. You pass light through it, it doesn't care what direction or polarization, there's no effect. On the other hand, then you lower temperature, you go to a pneumatic fluid, and so between cross-polarized, this isotropic fluid looks black because you get an extinction of light. You know, one polarization, you polarize it, then it can't get out, so you get black. And that's in transmission. <clears throat> but then you, you, cool, you, you cool down, I was discovered by Ranitz in 1886, you discover that molecules decide to orient. There's still a fluid, it's still a fluid, it's just completely pores and it, it it's, doesn't have a shear module, it's still kind of a viscous-like fluid, but now it's anisotropic, there's a particular axis picked out, so the molecules are aligned, but they're still randomly positioned, randomly moving around. And then if you cool further, then maybe they'll make layers. Each layer is a fluid, two-dimensional fluid, but now you make a periodic array of those layers. That's a smectic liquid crystal. And then you, maybe you cool further, you'll get smectic C where, you know, the molecules are now, rather than being perp along the normal, along the layer normal, they decide to tilt at some layer, at some, at some, at some angle. And so, you know, there's a succession of orderings that's intermediate between fully disordered liquid and a fully ordered crystal, and each of these have different uh, textures between the cross polarizers and various other interesting responses. And part of the kind of a challenge is try to figure out what is going on microscopically, how are they ordering in order to give these patterns, and maybe take advantage of this to make liquid crystal displays or other technology. Uh, and of course, they're extremely rich, they're topological defects, and there's many, many things you can study about these things. And so, in fact, what Reinitz had discovered is not an ordinary pneumatic like this one, but what he discovered is a, he was doing experiments in cholesterol benzoid, which is a chiral material, and what he discovered is uh, uh, yeah, I'm missing uh, a an image here, but it's okay. What he discovers is actually a cholesteric, what's called a cholesteric, and it's displayed here. So the molecules locally are aligned in some direction, but they actually like to twist like a, in a helical way. So there's a, a, they pick out a random axis, and then they twist around that axis. So just locally, it looks like a bunch of helices, but of course, they're not, it, it's still a fluid, but locally, there's a sense of twisting. And that's, in fact, where you, you dis your liquid crystal displays and your laptop are based on this material. So, you know, light comes in polarized, uh, comes in through one, one surface, it gets polarized, then it goes through the liquid crystal. If the liquid crystal is not, if the, if the electric field is on behind your pixel, then the liquid crystal molecules are like this, so they look isotropic to polarized light. And then they can't get out, so you see a black, let's say, dark in the, in the transmission. But if you have, if there's no electric field and the molecules are twisting like this, so now the polarization of light follows that twisting of the liquid crystal director, and now some of it can leak out, and that's a bright pixel. And so by turning on and off electric fields behind each pixel in your laptop, you can, you can modulate displays. But also, you know, nature takes advantage of this selective Bragg reflection from this periodic twisting or if you ever seen these thermometers that change color, you know, they sense where your temperature of your hand is as you, as you touch them, they, they're based on this because as a function of temperature, this pitch changes, uh, changes length, you know, the, 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 the size of the pitch changes, and so then there's a different color, selective reflection takes place at different, of different colors, right? So you see the change in color. Uh, so you get like tunable thermometers. As I already mentioned, bi all of biology is chiral, so my colleague Noel Clark and Michi Nakata was a postdoc at Boulder uh, a few years back, actually showed that if you take DNA molecules, chiral molecules, they display liquid crystal phases. These textures is an illustration that you get uh, liquid crystal phases. Uh, and it, it has a beautiful story of the origin of life, actually, that that they have based on this order in liquid crystal ordering. And in fact, that paper was uh, best paper and they just got an award uh, as the best paper in nature in 2018. 
So it's kind of a beautiful story, which I'm not telling you, but just, as a, just to flash up uh, that or, you, know, you don't need to do anything special if you just have elongated molecules that will arrange, they'll form liquid crystal phases. Like your soap in your, in your dishwashing detergent forms liquid crystal phases. If you look between cross polarizers, you will see textures, which means the light is birefringent. Different polarizations travel with different velocities. But just kind of uh, just to intrigue you even more, here's a, some small cross section of the kind of textures that you get in liquid crystals when you look between cross polarizers. And these are all distinct phases of matter. And again, a challenge is to understand what is going on here. What, how are the molecules, what is the ordering, molecular ordering organization that leads to this wealth of, uh, of ordering? <clears throat> OK, so that's kind of the introduction. And so what I want to tell you about is now a road to this new liquid crystal phase of matter, which is different than the ones I have just mentioned. It's kind of like the helical state that I talked about, except that helical state I talked about is explicitly, it's made up of explicitly chiral molecules like DNA, and so, or like the one that Ryan had first discovered. And so those, it's not surprising that it's chiral. If you have chiral constituents, take, uh, you know, ravioli or something like this, and then you know, they'll, they will organize. If you throw them on your pan, they will organize. And uh, if you squish them together, they will form chiral. You know, they will be, because they're chiral, they will, they will have chirality expressed macroscopically. But here, you, you, molecules are going to be achiral, and nevertheless, they make chiral phases. So that's, like a, that's, that's kind of an amazing thing. And so to drive that point home, I don't know why the, my screen is not blacking out, but this is. So, um, so ordinary liquid crystal molecules, kind of the most conventional workhorse of liquid crystals, is this uh, 5 CB molecule. CB stands for cyanobiphenol. Biphenol means two benzene rings, and there's a floppy tail. So it's like a, that's the rigid rod that I was displaying before. And so when you take these guys and put them in, you know, and, and have a collection of them, they display the liquid crystal phases that I discussed. But what was uh, investigated, you know, maybe uh, going back seven, eight years ago, is these kind of molecules, which uh, we call them CB7CB. So CB stands for, again, cyanobiphenol. This is another cyanobiphenol, and they're connected by an alkyl, seven carbon long al alkyl chain, so seven carbons here. And so, uh, so just think of it like two rigid rods, and they're connected by a, by a connect, uh, flexible connector. And the interesting thing is what I'm going to tell you about is that Basically, as long as you have an odd number here, odd number of carbons, then what I'm going to tell you about this phase, twist bend pneumatic phase, spontaneously chiral phase, uh, appears. But if it's even number of carbons, then it does not appear. And that's simple to understand. It's just simply for odd number of carbons, the low energy configuration of this, uh, uh, of this dimer is at an angle, and that's going to be kind of at the heart of it. And for even ones, just the, bond, the way the bonds are for even number of carbons, it wants to be a rod-like object, even though it's still floppy. Uh, so, uh, so just to jump ahead, to kind of give you the punchline, you know, these molecules are going to f form a liquid, but that liquid locally looks like that. And you know, so don't think of it like this is some kind of a crystalline thing. These things are moving everywhere, and that's going to be part of, the, part of the story that it's really still a fluid, but it's a chiral fluid, spontaneously chiral fluid. And so let me just go run through a few experiments that kind of demonstrate this. So first, first early experiments were in 2011, and they just saw that here's the pneumatic phase, and there's a heat capacity peak telling you there's a phase transition from the pneumatic phase to some other X phase, and they didn't know what it was. Uh, so it occurs around 100 degrees Celsius. You go from isotropic to pneumatic at 116 de degrees Celsius, and then 15 degrees later, you go to this uh, X phase. And indeed, you know, since then, we know it's actually this healing conical twist bend pneumatic. And so, but you know, from this measurement, we have no idea what that is. There's just some phase, and we, it's just different from this pneumatic phase, but what really, what is it? So you need to decipher what it is, so you need to do some uh, investigative work. So first thing you could do is you can make a cell, a liquid crystal cell, thin cell, so you can apply electric field perpendicular to the cell and look at it between cross polarizers. That's what these guys indicate. And so when you do that, you see there's actually two types of domains, dark and light, which means molecules are oriented somewhat differently with respect to polarizer analyzer. 
So that's one observation. That means there's two domains, or two types of domains, dark and light domains. So you still don't know what, that it, what it is, but that's the first hint of something going on. But then the next hint is, so that's what I call it. Well, OK, so the next hint is you put on an electric field perpendicular to the cell, and the white light switches to dark, and dark switches to light. So that means with the electric field, you can reorient the molecules. You can switch. And so the, to jump ahead, you know, to anticipate the answers, it's really, in retrospect, what this really is, is two chiral. You know, if you have something achiral, if it becomes chiral, it'll be macroscopic chiral, but you'll still have two chiralities coexisting, two macroscopic domains coexisting, or many domains coexisting, uh, but on macroscopic scale. OK, so but if you really want to understand what's going on further, you, know, you want to kind of verify this or think about, OK, how is it, how they organize. One way to do this is, uh, well, there are many probes. But one probe is we call freeze fracture. So what you basically do is you take your sample at a temperature that you're interested in, and you dunk it in liquid nitrogen. So you suddenly quench the, you know, the, basically the texture or the orientation or the location of all the molecules in your liquid crystal. And then you crack the sample open. And you look at the surface. Now that surface is now inside, you know, you're now looking inside the liquid crystal, which has been frozen uh, in the phase that you're interested in. And what you see is these incredibly beautiful parallel textures, sort of like the thing is layered, like it's a layered texture. And in fact, this suggests, this is what you would see if you had a spectic liquid crystal. If, you, if it was really layered, one of those layered phases that I showed you in the, in the introductory transparency, uh, this suggests it's a spectic phase. And in fact, the periodicity is like 80, uh, 8 nanometers. But if it's a layered phase, then you can do x-ray scattering and see that there's going to be a Bragg peak associated with this without doing this freeze fracture. So take the sample, do x-ray scattering, and you go and do x-ray scattering. If you do it on the smectic phase, here's a Bragg peak telling you that there's layered structure. That's the ordinary liquid crystal, HCB, smectic A liquid crystal. But if you do it on this liquid crystal, on eight, you know, uh, CB7, CB of this molecule, you see nothing. It's completely flat. So that's a proof that it's actually uh, fluid. There's no period, periodic ordering of any kind. There are no Bragg peaks. OK, so that's somehow in contradiction to what I showed you with the freeze fracture, that there's some kind of layering going on when I do freeze fracture. Right, so x-ray. And, and so what Noel Clark, my colleague Noel Clark and his uh, group had the sense of, sense of doing is doing, this is ordinary non-resonant x-ray scattering. So it's sensitive to electron density. So it just measures what the mass density is, where are the electrons. And so it says completely homogeneous. So it's a fluid. That's the definition of a fluid. But if you do resonant x-ray scattering, which is, re which is relevant to the, which is sensitive to the, polar, to the orientation of the molecules, then all of a sudden, lo and behold, you really see a Bragg peak. It's a Bragg circle because there are many different domains. So it's kind of you, you're seeing Bragg peak in all directions. But nevertheless, you see this pretty beautiful Bragg peak. And that Bragg peak, the wave vector, or the period, if you wish, as you approach the transition at this 101 degrees, that, that period or that pitch is you know, growing very rapidly. So it, it means you know, near the transition, it's a slow pitch you know, with a slow, long period, and then it becomes you know, shorter and shorter period. So that's, you know, you're starting to learn about the phase of matter. And so, and so yeah, so the structure that you decipher from this looks like this or looks like this. And it has about 8 nanometers period or pitch. So the other thing you can extract is you can look at the birefringence. So this thing is you start out in the pneumatic phase. So this axis is different than this, these two axes. So that's spontaneously picked out by the pneumatic. And then when you get into this phase, so that's what happens. You see, if you measure by refringence, meaning the, the index of refraction along this axis versus index of refraction along the, these two axes in the plane, it's a uniaxial material. So you see in isotropic phase, they're the same. So there's 0. This order parameter is 0. But when you get into a pneumatic phase, it starts growing, which means this axis becoming more and more different than the xy axis. And that's not surprising. That's because molecules begin to be more and more ordered. So they're, they're, in the, in the, they're becoming more and more aligned. So that's the index of refraction. So the material is becoming more and more uniaxially birefringent. But then when you get to this 101 magical temperature, the birefringence bio starts going down. And the way you can understand that, you know, if you combine it with what I talked about in x-ray scattering and the 
freeze fractures, you know, what, what's happening here is that at that transition, as you get into that phase, molecules tilt and they twist around. And as you go further, they, twist, they tilt more and they twist around. So the order parameter is not only the twisting, but it's also the tilting. And you might say, well, why is the bifurcation going down as you tilt? Well, it's because as you tilt, you know, on, because you're twisting, on average, you're spinning, you know, you know, you're kind of averaging around, by spinning around, you're averaging away this birefringence. Because you're no longer, on average, pointing along this axis. You're pointing along, you know, you're lying more in the xy plane. So this birefringence starts going down. Uh, as an order parameter, you can plot this angle of tilt, this angle theta from the z-axis, and it kind of grows like in a typical order parameter. So there's a, this beautiful phase transition that has been experimentally very well uh, described. Uh, so if you want to understand the elasticity of a pneumatic, uh, it's really described by uh, three elastic constants. So a splay elastic constants, how easy it is to splay molecules, as illustrated here. How easy it is to bend them, like a local region, and how easy it is to twist it. And there are three elastic constants. And what seems to be happening is that at this transition, this uh, bend elastic modulus is, uh, is plummeting, not to zero, but becoming very small. And that's an indicator that the that this system would like to twist. It's about, it's, it becomes cheaper and cheaper for it energetically to twist as you enter that phase. It's kind of a precursor. So anyway, so that, these are the experimental uh, evidence, and, but this is sort of the you know, collection of all that uh, data and simulations that kind of describes for you the, the nature of this phase. And in fact, it was anticipated back by, by Bob Meyer back in 1973 that this phase in principle could exist, but it's finally been discovered. Um, and so this is kind of the most technical you know, sort of illustration of it. It's eight nanometers pitch which is temperature dependent, but that's kind of the asymptotic when you get into the phase, that's the, and uh, so the molecules are tilted and they're kind of everywhere in the translation invariant way, they're spinning around the, spiraling around a, uh, around a cone like this. So, you know, some of you are, so this is all soft matter, but just to, if you're interested in sort of quantum magnetism and, quant, uh, and sort of hard condensed matter and solid state materials, just to make a small connection, you know, there are magnets, there are magnetic materials with a, without inversion symmetry, and they also like to form chiral. So the most prominent one, kind of the first one that's been studied, or the one that I, I am most familiar with is MNSI. And so they have very similar description as, uh, as these chiral uh, cholesteric phases. So, so they're, and in fact, they're known to display Magnetic, in the magnetic field temperature phase diagram, they have this rich, they have a paramagnetic phase, that's like the isotropic phase of the liquid crystal. But then they have helical phases and the conical phases, and in fact, there's a small uh, region, the so-called the A phase, which shows skirmionic crystal, where molecules twist in this two-dimensional lattice pattern of kind of columnar skirmion uh, that form a hexagonal lattice. So this is the cross-section of the skirmions. So there's, there's definitely connect, understanding chiral liquids has strong connections and uh, you know, it informs us also about chiral magnets. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, first, uh, first uh, part. So now what I want to tell you about is this emergent Higgs mechanism. Uh, this is somewhat, so the other two parts are much more theoretically minded uh, uh, and I'll try to be gentle. Uh, so, uh, so, so so the way we understand most conventional phases of matter is through spontaneous symmetry breaking. Namely, and that was taught to us by a uh, great uh, Soviet physicist, uh, Russian physicist, Lev Landau. And uh, so what he proposed is that, uh, it's kind of a phenological theory to understand phases of matter. So, you, so the first thing you try to do is you try to identify symmetries of your one phase and another phase. And you try to identify something that local, which you called an order parameter, like this vector s, which distinguishes this phase from this phase. So for example, on average, this, phase, this order parameter s, which is vectors representing this phase, on average in this phase is zero, because they're all pointing in every, every direction, so on average it's zero. 
While in this phase, on average, they're pointing up or down. So let's say on average, there's a non-zero S. OK, so this would be like a pneumatic. This would be uh, isotropic phase. And so the way he described this in terms of very simple polynomial, in, which is written in terms of S, so you have like A S squared plus B S to the fourth. Imagine B is some, A and B are some parameters. I don't know anything about them except one thing or two things. B is going to be always positive, and A can change sign. When A is positive, then if you think about it, this is just some kind of a paraboloid. It looks like this. I can even ignore this term. So it looks like a uh, paraboloid. So, so then if you minimize this energy, this phenomenological energy, then on average S is 0 because you sit at the minimum of this potential. That describes this phase. On the other hand, so that's low en there are no low energy modes, and it's very boring. It's just sitting there at that minimum. Maybe you're oscillating a little bit thermally around that. But basically, it's, an order, it's a disordered phase, fully disordered phase. On the other hand, when A changes sign, then the minimum is no longer at 0s. It's now its cross-section looks like this. But in you know, full two-dimensional view, if this is a uh, three-dimensional vector or two-dimensional vector, looks like this. So it wants to now sit at non-zero magnitude of s. It's completely degenerate with respect to what direction s points in, but it wants to have a particular a magnitude of s. And so that's what this looks like. So now s is magnitude of s is non-zero, but direction is completely randomly picked out, spontaneously picked out, and that's this spontaneous or vector phase of some sort. So that's how we understand phases of matter. And all other phases of matter, conventional Landau-like phases of matter, as we call them now, can be understood in this picture, just more complicated order parameters, more complicated polynomial that describes them, or energy function. So in that picture, we there's a mathematical way that field theory has taught us how to count low energy modes. And maybe this, let me go back here for a second. So this phase is completely boring. There's nothing interesting about it. You just sit at the minimum. Maybe you have some small oscillations around perfectly aligned, perfectly misaligned liquid crystals, so, or perfectly disordered phase. So on average, it's zero, but maybe it has some fluctuations. Sometimes I point this way, sometimes I point that way. Here, it's almost boring, but it actually has low energy excitations. Those are called Goldstone modes. It corresponds to long wavelength reorientations of your order parameter. Okay? So mostly it's aligned, but then there are low energy fluctuations. Uh, and those are free, uh, very, very cheap because there's no preferred direction in this order parameter once to point. So part of the story, if I want to describe this kind of a phase, I need to understand what are the Goldstone modes? What are the low energy excitations of the, of the system? And so we learn how to, if you take field theory courses, and symmetry breaking courses, courses on sort of Landau symmetry breaking. You learn how to count these Goldstone modes. And it's somewhat formal, and there's, it goes under the name of G mod H counting. I'm not going to, let me actually, because I'm running a little bit late, let me just skip over that. If, if you're familiar with it, then you can just read it. And if you're not familiar with it, then I'm just going to say it in words without mathematical uh, highbrow uh, description. So basically, if I want to know how many Goldstone modes I have, I simply ask how many ways can I, I sit in the ordered phase, let's say molecules are all aligned or spins are all aligned, and I simply ask how many ways can I move it to change it without any energy cost. And so if it's a bunch of vectors, so for example, yes, it's a bunch of vectors then that are aligned, like in a classical ferromagnet, then you know this doesn't change anything, so I'm not going to count this rotation. But you know, move, changing, picking this direction over that direction, that's a low energy mode. And then also this is a low energy mode. So you can think of this guy living on the surface of a sphere. Here it is. And the space of that sphere is the space of low energy modes. So the dimension of a two-dimensional sphere in this case, the dimension of the sphere is two dimensions. So there are two Goldstone modes. And that's, in fact, how kind of the most paradigm example, familiar example of Goldstone modes, there are two Goldstone modes of like in a classical ferromagnet. Okay. But this doesn't always work, and that's part of the part of my story. So there are examples where it doesn't work for quantum reasons, where I'm not gonna uh, when you're generators of this of this uh, of this symmetry, Sx and Sy don't commute, so that's one way it can fail. But there's another way it can fail, maybe a more famous one, more familiar one, is the so called Anderson Higgs mechanism. And I will explain it in more detail, and it depends a little bit you know, what these words mean to you. Uh, but 
I'll try to be general enough and uh, give enough information that you don't need any background for it. But basically, if you've seen any, if you know a little bit about superconductors or the standard model where W and Z bosons be, have a mass, uh, they, you start out with having gauge fields. So, so what the Sanderson Higgs mechanism corresponds to is you have some theory in which it looks like you're breaking symmetry. You have some order parameter, just like in this Landau theory. But in addition, there's a gauge fields that are around, like photon field or uh, uh, W bosons in the standard model, in electroweak uh, uh, sector of the standard model. When you order parameter, when you have an ordering in that kind of a theory, then it's well known that you lose some of the Goldstone modes. This this standard counting does not work. Okay, so what I want to convince you of is that in these chiral phases that I was talking about in the first part, something like this happens. Even though there are no gauge fields, it just happens dynamically. There's not really a, any kind of, it's not any kind of a gauge theory like a superconductor or a standard model, but nevertheless, something like that takes place. So let me show you, you know, let me set up a, set up a straw man to show you that there's indeed something strange going on. So, Imagine I have an, my isotropic phase before I go into this chiral state. So there are translations and there are rotations. There are three-dimensional rotations and three-dimensional translations. But when I order, I only have, I, I now have lower symmetry. And one way to describe a chiral state is I pick out an orthonormal triad. You know, if I, if I have a spiral, I have to tell you not just a direction like I did for a ferromagnet. I also have to tell you where I am on that spiral. So there's actually, looks like there's actually, I don't want to go through this mathematics, but looks like if I think about it in terms of this G mod H counting, it looks like I completely break rotational symmetry because I pick out all three axes for my own, for, to describe my uh, spiral state. So that means I have three Goldstone modes correspond to three Euler angles of this orthonormal triad. You know, I can still do this. And I can still do this like in a ferromagnet. But in addition, I can also rotate like this, and that changes my state. Right? So there are three Goldstone modes I would have thought. Okay? So my chiral pneumatic, cholesteric, should have three Goldstone modes. On the other hand, if you think about it, think about this ch uh, chiral state. Here it is. Bunch of twisted molecules like this. If you think about it, like if you zoom out and look at it, what does it look like? Well, it kind of looks like it's completely translationally invariant in this direction. And in this direction, it's periodic. Like when I rotate by 2 pi and I advance by 1 pitch, I'm back where I was. So let me draw equal orientation of planes. So if I did that and it was perfect, it would be just a bunch of parallel planes. Okay? If they fluctuate a little bit from this beautiful periodic pattern, as everything does when you have finite temperature or h bar, then the, these layers, will, you know, these equal orientational planes will fluctuate. So I can totally describe what the, what the fluctuations are of this chiral state in terms of a bunch of periodic fluctuations of periodic array of planes, featureless planes. And so how do I describe that? Well, it's just described by a single phonon, like, how much is this displayed relative to this? Displaced relative to this. So it looks like there's only one Goldstone mode. It's like a, it's like this is a one-dimensional crystal. It's only periodic in one direction. So there's one phonon mode. If you have a three-dimensional crystal, there are three phonon modes. Okay, but here there's only one phonon mode. There are no phonon modes in this direction because it's just a liquid. It's completely translation invariant. So from this perspective, I should only have one Goldstone mode. So this is like a physical perspective. This is a mathematical perspective. So somehow there's a disconnect between them. That's my straw man. And so, you know, people knew this back to, you know, going back to Dejean, who said that actually look, uh, elasticity of Goldstone modes of this theory, of this system, is exactly like that of a smectic, where you really have layer, true layering like this. He just proposed that based on this physical picture, and, it's, and that's the correct answer. And so the question is, well, so one approach is kind of very pragmatic approach. It's just the way it is. And you know, this system is different than all those field theory uh, contexts, field theory models that we learn this G mod H counting from. But another approach, is, which is kind of a, what bugged me for many years, is like, can I understand how this happens? why this happens from, you know, 
from a standard paradigm? And the, answers, the answer will be yes, I can. And it's in fact falls into this gauge theory paradigm where the gold store mode is being eaten by a gauge, effective gauge field. There's no really a, any kind of a gauge field, but there's like an effective gauge field. But, but to, to tell you the answer, this is what Dejean wrote down. He said the elasticity, the gold store mode is just one gold store mode, and here's its energy. And so this energy describes what it costs to make a spatial variation of that gold store mode. If I just simply translate, it costs nothing. So that's zero energy. So to have any energy, I have to have gradients. So how can I have gradients? Well, I can have gradients in the z direction. So clearly, if, if think of this as a spring. If I compress that spring, there's going to be compressional gradient u squared energy. And that's the bulk modulus. But in the perpendicular direction, suppose I make a gradient in the perpendicular direction. But the gradient in the perpendicular direction just rotates the whole structure by some angle. Think about it. If I have a gradient of u, it means u is growing linearly with this direction. It means I just tilted it by a little bit. So, but this thing is spontaneously chosen. So there cannot be any energy cost that depends on the gradient of u, perpendicular gradient of u. It can only depend on the curvature, the second derivative of u. So that, based on that reasoning, Dejean just wrote that down. And that's exactly how it is in the symmetric liquid crystal that I drew here. Basically, any periodic structure, one-dimensional periodic structure, universally, just from universal physics, universal arguments, symmetry arguments, has this structure. It has two derivatives in the perpendicular direction and one derivative in this direction. This is compression, so that costs energy. If you, if you try to change the period, it, it, it incre or stretch it or compress it, it costs energy. But if you try to rotate, it costs no energy. So you have to curve it to have some energy cost. So that's very important. And so, you know, but it, there was no derivation of this. And so I set out to try to derive this and try to understand, in the process, try to understand where, you know, why are you losing Goldstone mode? See, there's, a, there's only one Goldstone mode here. But on the other hand, I talked to you about this orthonormal triad. So what happens to the other two Euler angles, if you wish? And, you know, so I don't know if I want to go through this com completely in detail, but basically you start out with the elasticity of a pneumatic. This is the elasticity I showed. But you put in some chiral piece. So this is, this is splay, like this. This is bend, where what it costs to bend the liquid, locally bend the liquid crystal. And this is how much it costs to twist it. But what I put, if I put this Q naught, it means it wants to twist. So it prefers to have non-zero twist, because there's this, it, the minimum is not a twist equal to zero, but non-zero. That's how I build in chirality. Build, build in chirality. So it, when these elastic constants are all the same, it reduces to something much simpler. It's like a nonlinear sigma model with an external twisting term, preferred twisting term. That's what, that's what controls liquid crystals in your laptop, if you wish. That's what I started with. They're twisting from front to back. OK, so how do you describe this, just to give you some idea? So you say, well, E1 wants to twist. So there's some orthonormal triad, E1, E2, and E3. So he wants to twist in the E1 to E2 plane. And this is E3. So it's trying to twist. So if it was twisting perfectly, you would have E1, E2, maybe x and y and z. And then there would be some cosine and sine. That's just the twisting. But I want to describe low energy fluctuations. So I want to have a describe a general state. So what can happen? Well, I could twist slightly faster, slightly slower in some region. And I can also change my coordinate system. You know, my orthonormal triad can fluctuate. That's the three Euler angles. E1 and E2, E3. So I make them spatially dependent. And now what I do is I take this, I stick it in here, and I massage, and I, uh, and I pray, and then you, know, you do some manipulations in the end. Lo and behold, something like this come out, comes out, and what it looks like is like a gauge theory. There's a gradient of this phase is coupled to something that looks like a gauge field. A is a spin connection, which is this orthonormal triad, this, how this orthonormal triad is changing in space. And then the, it also couples to E3, which is the, the third component of this orthonormal triad. So if you're familiar with superconductors, this looks like a gradient of a phase of a superconductor minus the gauge field squared. This is like the kinetic energy. And this is like the Maxwell term. This is like magnetic curl of the vector potential. If this is the vector potential, this is like the gradient of the vector potential. That's like the magnetic field. And this is like the external magnetic field, which wants it to twist. 
So there's all these analogies with, with hard condensed matter physics. Anyway, if you massage it a little more, it looks even more like the, uh, what we call a U1 gauge theory of a helical state. So it looks like this. And so, lo so you see already here what's happening. Uh, you see, you had E1, E2, and E3. But E1 and E2, their rotation, their fluctuation give, is actually the same thing as a gradient of phi. If, I, you know, if E1 rotates into E2, that's like advancing the phase. So, we can, so we've gotten rid of E1 and E2. But then you have E3 left over. But what this term says is, if you twist along a particular direction, you, wanna, you, want, you want the twist orientation, which is grad phi, not to deviate from the orientation of E3. Which means, you know, if your orthonormal triad is like this, you want to you wanna have the planes oriented along E3. So they're kind of locked together energetically. You see, if I change this without changing this, it costs energy. So I don't want to do that. So the low energy is, if you're going to have phi fluctuate, its gradient better equal to fluctuations of E3. So E3 rotates and the gradients of phi rotate. That's very much like in the smectic when I said, or when in that picture of Dejan's. Uh, and indeed, at low energies, E3 just gets locked to grad phi. This is exactly what a Higgs mechanism is. Vector potential gets locked to the gradient of the phase. Uh, and so if you now do that, you now, what we call in the jargon of the trade, integrate out E3 because it's a gapped mode relative to this difference is gapped. So you can integrate out E3 or you can just simply eliminate it this way at low energies. And lo and behold, this emerges, which looks like exactly like what Dejean wrote down, except you get this nonlinear term as well, which is important. But if you strike this nonlinear term, this is exactly what Dejean wrote down. But now we have some prediction. For example, this bulk modulus is actually related to the K of the original theory. And the, this K bar is just one half, is related, is proportional to the K of the original liquid crystal pneumatic. OK, so maybe I'll skip over this, but you can use this theory to compute lots of things. For example, predict some experiments. You can study pneumatic. Uh, you can study uh, light scattering. Uh, and so there's a, as you approach the transition to this phase, you see that there's a peak emerges at finite wave vector. That peak is exactly a precursor to this twisting. That Q is the Q that you saw in the, that Noel Clark saw in this uh, resonant x-ray scattering. It's the, it's the precursor of that ordering. You're still in pneumatic phase, so that's why this peak is not infinite. It's not divergent, but it's telling you, oh, the fluctuations are such that they're dominant around this Q. And then you can make a theory of this, so I'm going to maybe skip over this, except to say that the theory of this ordering transition from the pneumatic to this twist bend pneumatic looks very much like uh, Ginzburg-Landau theory, but except psi is a complex vector order parameter. Uh, and, and so you can, just, you can understand a lot about this transition uh, in terms of this formulation. Uh, you can also, this formulation also allows you to access these Kermion-like uh, states, which has been, as I mentioned, been observed like in MNSI, but you also then predict that they can exist in these cholesteric liquid crystals. Uh, so let me not dwell on that. And let me turn to the, like, for the last five, seven minutes, turn to the kind of the last uh, uh, theoretical uh, component of this, uh, of this lecture. So it's, I call it critical phases. So this is a little bit theoretical, but I, I, th I hope to give you some, some uh, uh, flavor of what, you know, of this theme. So as I mentioned, you know, so for the past, you know, 50, 55 years, depending how you count, 60 years, you know, people have been studying critical phenomena, studying fluctuations, meaning going beyond mean field cartoon pictures. And what's really the upshot of it is that fluctuations for, the most, um, for, the, for most of these Landau systems, uh, conventional systems, fluctuations are only, and nonlinearities are only important near a critical point between two phases. So if you have a continuous phase transition between one phase and the other, at that point, you're fine-tuned to that point, and there the system cannot decide, to be in, cannot decide between being in this phase or that phase. It's kind of right on the, on the verge between the two. And so then the fluctuations are enormous, and much of the energy in the last 50 years spent trying to understand how to describe these strong fluctuations 
at a critical point. And so the conventional picture is like this. In terms of cartoons, the ordered phase, in terms of this Landau functional that I talked about, the ordered phase is boring. Sorry, disordered phase is boring. Because described by this parabola, you just sit in this minimum. Maybe you fluctuate a little bit. But basically, on average, your order parameter is 0. And so we, in the jargon of the phase, OK, so the, the Landau functional just looks like s squared. So it's just paraboloid. So it's boring. And uh, in the jargon of the, of the trade, we say that the high te uh, infinite temperature fixed point describes this, uh, this disordered phase. On the other hand, the ordered phase is a little bit more interesting, but again, is described by some gradient of s. Gradient of s is non-trivial because there are Goldstone modes that I've been talking about in the second part of this, of this uh, colloquium. But it's also pretty boring. It's just described, again, by this Gaussian fixed point, basically a quadratic theory. And if this phase is stable, everything, we understand everything about these phases. You just need to identify what the Goldstone modes are. And then once you've identified it, you understand everything. And all the, ch all the kind of challenges around a critical point, where in some sense you tune this s squared to 0, which is non-zero here. Here you tuned it finally to 0 by tuning to t exactly to the critical point. And then if you wish this in a cartoon form, this potential is kind of flat. So then there's a lot of sloshing back and forth. You kind of can't decide to be this or that. Okay, and so then, oh, it doesn't know what, how to order. And so then, these fluctuations is what makes this challenging. You have a gradient of s squared, but you ha since this is zero, you have to include nonlinearities. And so then, it's it's very very challenging to describe. Uh, and so you know, when you do describe it, you get all kinds of phenomenology. You get that correlation. You get all kinds of power loss. Correlation like diverges with some universal exponent as a function of how far away you are from TC. Uh, Magnetization or the order parameter grows in this non-analytic way. Susceptibility, heat capacity, correlation functions in space have these co uh, universal properties. And they have exponents that are universal. That's what's incredible about them. These, these numbers are just universal. They're only dependent on dimension of space of your sample and symmetries of the critical point, what kind of a phase transition you describe. It. But they don't depend on anything else. It's just a pure number. But so I want to contrast this picture of critical points, which is an uh, old hat now, although we still study it, like I showed you about the, uh, when I was studying the, uh, this twist bend pneumatic phase, with another picture where what critical phase is in terms of this kind of a phase diagram. So the disordered phase is still boring. The critical point is still interesting and challenging. But now the whole phase is kind of uh, has this flatness about in it in a cartoonish way, so I'm not explaining it in technical terms. But, and so what that means is, basically, this Gaussian fixed point is unstable to nonlinearities. And really, what controls the ordered phase is an is a fi attractive fixed point, which kind of has this flavor. So you can no longer ignore nonlinearities in the ordered phase, where before you could only not ignore nonlinearities at the critical point. And so the upshot is that the, there are many kind I mean, these are exotic phases of matter, but there are still ever-growing class of them of critical matter from various uh, um, fluctuating membranes, you know, columnar liquid crystals, certain kind of rubber, certain kind of magnets, and smectic liquid crystals. Here's the cholesteric that I talked about that have this character. They're examples of these weird, strongly fluctuating phases of matter. Uh, and so let me just give you a flavor of it either for smectic liquid crystals or the cholesteric that I talked about. So just a little bit of technicality. So here's the elasticity that Dejean wrote down in 1973 and that I derived for you or sketched for you that describes any one-dimensional periodic uh, array, you know, phase. So it has a, a Laplacian here squared and a gradient for compression. So if you look at this, that's study fluctuations of the phonons. You know, when I draw them, I draw them like this, like it's a beautiful, perfect pattern as a cartoon. But how much is it really fluctuating if I turn on temperature? Well, let's calculate it. We're going to let's Fourier transform this into normal modes. Then it looks like normal mode k squared times this stiffness. So this Laplacian becomes k perp to the fourth. And this q, uh, d, 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 z becomes kz squared. And these are the stiffness. So this is just the rewriting of this in Fourier space. And now I can just do recuperation or Gaussian integrals, whatever you prefer. 
and I can ask, how big is URMS? What is the RMS fluctuations of this phonon? And lo and behold, amazingly, if you calculate this URMS, it actually, at any finite temperature, diverges like a log of the system size. So that means that this cartoon is really bad in characterizing how much it's fluctuating. It's fluctuating enormously, although, you know, log is a slow varying function, but if I take like a macroscopic sample, and, you know, this cold, and temperature is, is modest, you know, at any one point or two points are extremely, you know, are fluctuating. Qualitatively, it's, it's in no sense it's a periodic, as I will show in a second. So it's like a power law correlated phase, even though you're in three dimensions. It's like Kausalis-Thalus phase or XY model phase, for those who are familiar with it, except this is, happens in three dimensions. While there, you have to go all the way down to two dimensions. And, you know, what does that mean? Let's translate this into, suppose I calculate average uh, density. Well, it's a, some, a good cartoon for it. Is there some amplitude? Modulation times the cosine. So if there was no phonons, if phonon was zero, like I was at zero temperature, nothing was fluctuating, this would be just some periodic thing. That's what this cartoon shows. But suppose I add a phonon now, and then I turn on temperature. So now there's like a phase that's fluctuating. It's like a periodic function whose phase I'm like varying in space. So then it's going to average out. So because this guy is logarithmic, it turns out this average actually averages out to zero. So in no sense, it's really, we call it periodic, but it's actually not periodic. It's on average, it's zero. In any finite system, it's periodic. So there's a, in a finite system of size L, it's going to have some amplitude, which is non-zero. But it, it decays as a power, uh, which, uh, which is the theta exponent. Then you can do structure function, and you won't get Bragg peaks. You get quasi Bragg peaks. So that's another indicator of it. So anyway, uh, so these fluctuations are very important. And because they're very important, because they're so large, it turns out you cannot ignore these nonlinearities that I derived for you uh, that appear here. So it's not just the Gen model. You have to go beyond. You have to go beyond this model. You have to include nonlinearities. And in fact, these nonlinearities are important. And I I don't have time to really discuss them in detail, but they're there and they come in with a very special coefficient. And the reason when I argued that this is a Laplacian, I said it, it's and there's no gradient U terms. It's because if I do an infinitesimal rotation, that could not cost any energy. But if you think about it, if I do an infinitesimal rotation, along the z-axis, I've actually looks like I've stretched the layers because of the hypotenuse that I'm now looking at along. But that still shouldn't cost any energy. So that means there's a non-zero du dz along the z direction, but that can be compensated by rotation by this nonlinear term. So if you want to enforce Rotational invariance with respect to large angle, not just infinitesimal angle, which is the real symmetry, not just infinitesimal rotation, then it's this thing is exactly the right combination that makes this whole picture rotational invariant with respect to large rotation, as it must be. So you have to include those nonlinearities. That's how you know how they come in. But you usually, we usually throw them away. But here we cannot throw them away because without them, this thing is divergent. It's fluctuating like mad. So once something fluctuates like mad, you need to include nonlinearities. And uh, if you include them, it just suffices to say you get this critical phase. So this cholesteric is like a critical phase uh, below three dimensions. Um, let me skip over that and let me just conclude by summarizing. So what I talked about three things. Uh, so one is the new spontaneously chiral fluid of a chiral molecules that we call helical pneumatic. It was discovered, and I kind of uh, took you through the road to its discovery and deciphering what that phase is. Then discussing these kind of a chiral twisted pneumatics, including this kind of phase, I try to explain to you that naive counting of Goldstone modes that we usually use in field theory doesn't work for this thing. And the way to understand it, in fact, why there's not three Goldstone modes of an orthonormal triad, but only one Goldstone mode, which is this phone on you, is you can understand if if you like that kind of thing, as an emergent Higgs mechanism. So there's something dynamical that happens that locks some of the low energy degrees of freedom to other low energy degrees of freedom. And so as a result, you have fewer low energy degrees of freedom left over. And finally, I discussed a kind of a general class, pretty broad and ever-growing class of phases, of which this one's an example, that I call cr uh, critical phases. And those critical phases display power law, universal power law behavior all the way through, a through the phase, 
throughout the phase, not just at a critical point. And so there are a lot of open questions and interesting directions to pursue. But uh, with this, let me stop and thank you for your attention. No, so that's why it's so interesting. It's actually not a line. And the reason, so here it is. So it's, a, it's actually a fixed, attractive fixed point. So it's, in that sense, it's much more interesting than the XY model. So in the X, 2D XY model, you have a line of fixed points. And that's why the critical expo exponents in the 2D XY model are non universal. Like the power law eta exponent depends on the ratio of temperature to the elastic constant. And it changes as you go from here to here in the XY model. Because you're going, a it's like every point is a different, point, a different uh, system. Here, no. So here you actually have a flow along this line. And it all flows to this one point. So that's why it's universal. It's like universality at a wilson fisher fixed point or any other critical point. It's the behavior or this. These elastic, these uh, critical exponents of this critical phase are completely universal numbers. They're like two thirteenth and you know five thirteenth. They're just some numbers. Don't depend on anything. They just depend on dimension of space. And so that's what's amazing about it. And that's indicated by this RG flow. You, you, the in the jargon of the trade, you say the Gaussian fixed point is unstable, but it's not unstable to infinity. It's unstable, and it all flows into this. So this flow shows you like if you're just a little bit below this thing. Ultimately, at long enough scales, I don't care where I start, what microscopic theory I start, I end up here. And that's why it's universal. So it's an infrared attractive fixed point that describes the critical phase. No, so the quartic term is there, and it kind of balances the quadratic terms. Just like it occurs, you know, it's, it's, well, you need to do an RG calculation to really quantify this. But you can think of it as like you have a quadratic term and you have a nonlinear term. Qu uh, quadratic term, the trivial quadratic term vanishes for symmetry reasons. So now you have a quartic and quadratic term, and they both balance each other and they balance KBT. So there's like this subtle, non trivial balance between thermal, uh, you know, sort of agit agitation, nonlinearity, and the harmonic term. And so they all balance together to give you this perfect criticality throughout the phase. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the question is, is the, does the Higgs mechanism also kill off, kill off the various types of defects uh, that you normally get from G mod H uh, counting? Absolutely, it definitely has an impact. So if you didn't have this coupling, there are defect, certain kind of defects that would cause, you know, so the energy of the defect goes up enormously because of this coupling. Because the defects require often violation of this locking. So as a result, they cost enormous amount of energy. And so there are other examples of it, like if you take a crystal, three-dimensional crystal, let's say two-dimensional crystal, where I have numbers in my fingertips. Uh, take two-dimensional crystal, there are two types of de uh, defects there, disclinations and dislocations. So if you're in the, and there are three types of phases. There's a liquid phase, isotropic liquid, there's a hexatic phase, and there's a crystal phase. So in the crystal phase, well actually let me preface it before I talk about defect. You might have, another, another manifestation of this phenomenon, of this Higgs mechanism phenomenon, is a two-dimensional crystal, or any crystal for that matter. So take a two-dimensional crystal. You might say naively from this G mod H counting, you have, you broke rotational invariance. So let's say three-dimensional crystal. You broke three rotations, and you broke three translations. So why don't we have six cold store modes? Three associated with the bond angle rotations, and three with the uh, translations. You only have two, or you only have three in three dimensions, the phonons. You don't have the, so the, the orientational degrees of freedom are gapped out in exactly the same way as here. The bond orientational degrees of freedom, they used to be Goldstone modes in the, in the hexatic phase, orientational phase, become gapped out. 
So there are to certain topological defects, like disclinations, which are defects, singularities in this bond angle. They used to be logarithmic, that's in two dimensions. But when you go to a crystal, be they become system size square dependent. So it very much de depends on the type of defect, but some defects get completely confined and, and extremely costly once you go into the Higgs phase. Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. So first of all, okay, so I had the E1, E2, and E3, and particularly E1 and E2. So rotation of E1 and E2, that's the same thing physically as phi. Well, that's exactly what gauge symmetry or gauge redundancy is. You introduce redundant variables because in terms of them, description is local. That's exactly what happens. You know, there's no vector potential. Vector potential is not physical. Phase of a of an order parameter or a, you know electron is not physical. The only thing that's physical is the grad phi minus a. So, um, so, so that's a description in terms of which it's it, it's in fact simple and local. But you're actually right. So there's actually two kinds of gauge fields. So and two kind of so this part is trivial. So there's this redundancy exactly as you say. If I rotate e1 into e2. That's like I can, I can get rid of that by, getting, by simply redefining my grad phi. So you're exactly right. So that's one way Higgs mechanism comes in. But there's still something, something else. E3, fluctuations of E3. So the one that's more, I'm more focused on and more non-trivial is this one. So here I have E3, and that's really fluctuations of this orthonormal triad. It's the third component. It has two, two components that can fluctuate. And those guys are really are energetically locked. You see, so now I'm going to get rid of A by get, canceling it out and absorbing it to grad phi. You see, there's no more A. But there's still something left over that's non-trivial. And that guy is, that distinction is really physical. If I have like an orthonormal triad describing my, uh, my, uh, my uh, helix, that's a, di that's a microscopic a distinct degree of freedom than the gradient of the, of the equal potentials or equal orientational planes. And so those guys lock together kind of energetically. The, unlike true Higgs mechanism, unlike true gauge theory, where you cannot measure this, you know, in ordinary gauge theory, you cannot measure vector potential, you cannot measure the phase, you can only measure this thing, this combination. Here, these guys are physical. They're just locked uh, uh, energetically together. But they're actually like, it, what's beautiful about this, what I find beautiful, is not just the analogy to gauge theories and to superconductors, but it's actually like a superconductor in which you can measure a phase and the vector potential independently. They're physical observers. They just get locked together energetically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do I see what? Well, it's, it's the fact that these fluctuations of these layers are kind of a, occur, uh, they're so wild, they occur on all scales. You know, it's the way you try to visualize it, there's like, there's no scale in the problem. It's just a power law theory. You see, it's all gradients. It's all derivatives plus nonlinearities of derivatives, derivatives of nonlinear derivatives. And so things are just fluctuating like mad, and they're, there are fluctuations on all scales, and those fluctuations grow with, you know, with some universal exponents, like the theta exponent. So it, you know, there's no intrinsic scale in the problem. You see, if I had like a, maybe one more thing I could say. Like, You know, when I have this, when I have this uh, R here, 
then there's a length scale, which is a ratio of r, which, which is, you know, r has units of, if you compare it, there's an s squared here, there's an s squared here, s, s squared here. So there's a gra Laplace in here, gradient squared, that has units one over length squared, so r must have units of one over length squared. So there's a natural length scale. But imagine I kill this r squared. For some reason, I either tuned it to be zero, or in the critical phase, it's self-tuned to be zero. Then there's no, like here, then there's no length scale. Because without phi squared, it's just, you know, it's just, there's nothing to compare grad phi squared to. And then it, it only, what, what really gives this critical phase is the, these fluctuations balance against nonlinear terms. So there's no length scale. It's exactly because r phi squared is exactly zero all throughout here. 